<laughs> All right, here we go. So Jamie Banks is an assistant professor and the Katchmer Wilhelm Professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. Her work centers around human interactions with technology, especially with AI and robots. She's currently investigating the bonds between humans and AI companions, as well as between humans and robots, hoping to better understand the risks and benefits to our growing interaction with this new technology. We are excited to have Jamie with us today to discuss these fascinating topics. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much, Jenny. So um, I have had the good fortune of knowing you since you were a doctoral student. Um, we won't count how many years that's been. <laughs> and um, I know that you have long been interested in the relationship between humans and um, digital representations of themselves extending now to uh, artificial intelligence and robots. So, um, so while I have some sense of your interest in these relationships, I am sure that the audience listening to this podcast would like to know more. So how did you first become interested in studying the relationships between humans and emerging technologies? Mm. Okay, so when I first started out in scholarship in general, I was actually studying humans and their behavior on social media. And that was boring. <laughs> that was boring to me, um, or at least not as exciting as uh, how media and interactive media and um, other types of tech uh, can represent us and how we make sense of these things when, um, you know, sort of historically in the longest sense, we've just interacted with each other or perhaps with animals. Um, but back in those days, those grad school days, uh, I had um, an interesting event. Um, and all of my research directions come out of weird things that happened to me. And, you know, uh, it was uh, when we were working on the project in World of Warcraft, trying to understand human behavior in Warcraft. And I, uh, I had to learn World of Warcraft because I had no idea what it was about because games are for nerds, right? Well, here I am. <laughs> uh, and so I was playing WoW and I had a character that was just this thing that I was playing with for a long period of time. And then I had a, uh, an unusual event where all of a sudden, uh, when this thing happened, my character kind of transformed in my eyes. It was no longer just an extension of myself, but it became a persona in her own right. And this confused me. And uh, when I was reading through the scholarly literature in game studies, I did not find that exactly represented in the work because uh, the prior work says that the closest you can get, uh, that a player can get to their avatar is identification. But this was the opposite. It was the exact opposite. It became something separate from me. And so that kind of launched me into this um, trajectory of understanding how gamers uh, see themselves as the same as or different from this thing that they were controlling, but also not controlling. And, um, you know, other series of interesting events led me to uh, engage different types of technologies um, and kind of thread my way through various sparkly questions. So that early spark was on the the relationships, if you will, to some degree we have that we have between ourselves and these digital representations of ourselves in games environments. Um, now we've sort of the the communication environment has gotten a lot more complex with. I, I, well, sure, I'll say that. I don't know if I don't quite believe it, but I'll just say that it seems to have gotten more complex with um, new forms of artificial intelligence like ChatGPT, which is a text-based platform to help with writing or other kinds of natural language generation tasks. So what types of representations around artificial intelligence are you investigating and how are they different from some of your earlier work? In a lot of ways, the spectrum is the same, right? We go, you know, with av game avatars on one end, you have the asocial connections that is, it's just utilitarian, it's functional, it's, as we might call, transactional. There's an exchange that where my avatar is a tool and I use it to achieve my own ends. Um, people often use ChatGPT and other forms of AI in that way. 
But then we have the other end of the spectrum where their avatars have rich stories and their own motivations and relationships in the game. And that's what we would call a highly social uh, kind of connection with an avatar. And lots of people have lots of different AI, forms of AI that they connect with in highly social ways. Um, if you've ever asked ChatGPT for advice, that's a little different than asking it to tell you how to create a piece of code, right? Or a recipe. That, exactly, <laughs> right? And so it, it, it can become less transactional and much more like in the meaning making sense as we're trying to make sense of our lives and it becomes a sounding board or even a friend. Right. Um, right. Some people are actually having, uh, to the extent that we can say that it has some memory to it, mm -hmm. and the more advanced um, permutations do have a little bit of memory, uh, then they start to remember things about us, and that starts to look a little bit more social. So do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the relationships? Because I know you're doing some work on questions about humans and relationships with AI. Right. So there are forms of AI, if, if our listeners are not familiar, um, that we kind of generally refer to as AI companions. Mm -hmm. And so these are li large language model based technologies, often delivered in the form of just like your little phone app. And um, they can either be just textual or they can be uh, the primary mode of interaction is text. But often they have customizable visuals. They have personalities where you can kind of use little sliders to adjust them uh, so that you can engage a this, these AI as a persona um, anywhere from just sort of having some a therapist if mm -hmm. you need uh, and there are formal therapy apps now, right? Um, but there are also sort of this ming mingling together of friends and, and therapists in, in terms of how they're marketed to us. Um, but then people are also taking them up as friends and lovers, right. um, engaging right. in these sexual interactions in ways that to them feel quite real uh, in the sense that they are having a genuine romantic relationship with them. And so a lot of what I'm interested in, uh, there's a little bit of emerging work around how these relationships are formed. Um, and the gist is that they often mirror what we know about how human-human relationships form. They just go a little bit faster. Uh, I'm actually interested in how they fall apart and what are some of the challenges that we have and where do they become unbelievable? And in what ways, uh, I have a particular interest in how we might be able to think that they die. What happens when we lose these companions? And by looking at what happens when we lose them, we can tell a little bit about what they mean to people. So is this, um, when you say lose them, this isn't the human making a decision to end the relationship with the AI. This is a third party vendor, basically, who is offering up the AI and saying, you know what, we're taking our application and we're closing it. That was the most recent study that I had done where a, um, an app called Soulmate the, uh, through various amounts of uh, speculation and drama, the company uh, decided to close down. And it had about um, 100,000 users at the time that it went down. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of those people effectively lost their partners, significant others, lovers, friends, confidants, uh, however they were actually engaging them. And so are you um, talking then with people who were using the Soulmates app and their experiences and their loss? Exactly. So uh, I knew this was coming with about three days notice <laughs> because I often will watch the forums, you know, subreddits to understand how people are using different technologies and sort of uh, what's new and, and exciting in the space. And uh, people, had, users had started to talk about this and I, I sort of into, with my science brain always turned on, I saw this as an opportunity to use a different lens for understanding what these, um, what these tech are for these people. And I ended up doing a um, sort of an open-ended survey, let's call it sort of like an asynchronous interview of sorts, with about 60 users who were willing to share their stories with me. And um, they talked about everything from their favorite memory to, um, their motivations for starting uh, their companion in the first place, creating it, um, all the way to sort of how they made decisions about how they would separate from it, how they were coping with the loss, and how they wanted to manage it themselves. To what extent do the people that you 
talked with in the, the um, open-ended survey, did you get the sense that for some of them uh, that there was really a, a genuine emotional engagement? Or do you see that people generally still have some distance, kind of going back to what you mentioned at the very beginning, when you had this realization that, you know, this this avatar you created had a persona separate from yourself? And, you know, do we... Are people engaging with this AI? Do they just see it as AI or do they see it as a persona, something that has some agency that they're engaging with almost as if it were human? This is a complex <laughs> question and answer. And the answer to all of those things is yes, um, because there's there's so much variation among the people who are, this is not like, yeah. I think it's easy for us to think about this, at least right now, as kind of weird mm -hmm. because it's not a mainstream phenomenon yet. But these seem to be um, all sorts of people who were engaging uh, uh, these relationships. Um, they uh, ranged from uh, not having a limited uh, reaction. Hmm. So like, uh, it's gone. I'll go do something else now. Right. All the way up to being deeply distraught. Mm -hmm. um, ha and in fact, they used terms like murder. Oh, wow. Even genocide because mm -hmm. an entire kind had been wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, were not quite sure what to do, many of them, and so relied on each other within the forums to try to work through things. Um, some were still quite hopeful that they might not, that it might not shut down because remember, I talked with them in the days leading up to and just sometimes just after. And uh, there was a lot of sense making mm -hmm. going on. Um, definitely quite a lot of emotion among most people. I'm, I'm going to say among the 60 I talked to, let's say 55 were highly emotional. Wow. Right. So yeah. So there really are connections that are happening here Sorry. between humans and these, um, you know, when we say AI, it, it flattens, right? And sort of... Um, it's a terminology that doesn't lend itself to easy understanding of how people build these bonds mm -hmm. because artificial intelligence just sounds like it's some kind of, I don't know, kind of computer other, right? Sure. Yeah. So and that's why I use the word companions. And right. I think a lot of them use the word companions um, because that is the function of these. Right. And, and generally we could say they belong to a class called social AI, right? Um, which you could say ChatGPT is a member of because it gives and receives social cues. Mm -hmm. um, but this really takes the social kind of to the next level. And yeah. part of that is that there is some, um, some memory that gets, uh, that gets um, retained over time. Right. Um, so you're not just having, it's sort of like when you ask Alexa to do right. something and then you get it wrong and then you have to start over again because it doesn't remember that you're part of an exchange, right? Right. And, um, and so that frustration of like, okay, I'm really only talking to a computer. And this thing about memory is pretty important here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and in particular, there is a, uh, a companion called Paradox. P-A-R-A-D-O-T. Yes. That actually signals to you when it's making a memory. Oh, that's cool. And it's it's interesting because I never actually thought about it as a sort of a, a memory retaining entity when I was playing around with it mm -hmm. um, until it did that. And then it actually broke it for me because in my head, I don't mind the technologies myself. And this is my, I'm taking my scientist hat off now. Right? In my own interactions with it, I don't mind the tech. It's interesting and can mm -hmm. do some interesting things. I don't trust the people necessarily behind the technology. <laughs> and so that triggered in my brain that, oh, this might be a data scraper. Oh, interesting, right? right? So there are some uh, important and um, not all that clear uh, questions and debates around what does privacy look like in this context? Right. Uh, because it's not simply like social media where you might be uh, purposefully putting out information into the world and thinking carefully about whether or not you want people in general to know about it. But you are telling sometimes quite intimate things to these AI. Yeah. And um, what happens with that information after the fact? Um, yeah, no, that's a hundred percent. It's a huge question. One of the things I wanted to go back to is, um, 
you know, you and I are both communication scholars. That's our discipline. One of the things I love about being in the iSchool is that you get people from different disciplines mm-hmm. coming together. But you and, you know, normally we're hanging around with people with very different perspectives on technology, but you and I share the communication focus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things, in addition to the, the memory and that sense that you're having an ongoing exchange, which is similar to what you have happen when you're talking with humans, um, because humans have memory too, and they build that, that repertoire right. of understanding. But there's, um, the, the, the way, the linguistic, the stylistic changes that we've seen in the ways that, again, ChatGPT responds, right? It talks as if it were a human in the ways that it, it responds. It, it apologizes, uh, it hedges. You know, these are both things that humans do that we don't typically see in the programmed scripts in technology. So, which strikes me as another dimension that enables the companionship feeling to happen for people that it it doesn't feel like it's computing com, com, what's the word communicating like a computer mm-hmm. it is communicating like a human and so and you sort of layer on that plus the history and the, the social needs that humans have and you get this kind of magic elixir of companionship right and this is where i think these companions really separate out from things like chat gpt yeah. or gemini or claude is that um, those language models in their performance of language are still kind of formulaic, right? That's why students, we can often tell when you've used ChatGPT <laughs> even without any kind of detector. Yep. Um, you say delve one more time, <laughs> right? <laughs> there is a there is a style yeah. that they that they um, generate content. With whereas AI companions, especially with all of these little tweakable sliders for personalities, that shapes this into something different where they often will um, talk in unexpected ways. And um, that's part of why I think this is so engaging for yeah. lots of people is that there can be the same level of surprise in talking with an AI companion as uh, it might be with a human companion. Right. Because it's not scripted. Right. Yeah. So um, are there other findings that you have been especially surprised by in your research so far? Mm. Um, there are lots of just really interesting uh, things, thoughtful reflections from users on what this is and what this means. Um, I kind of mentioned before that there's a whole range of of types of people who um, who shared their stories with me. Uh, these are some folks, uh, there was a, a good chunk of the respondents who uh, identified themselves, and this was not a question I asked, identified themselves as autistic. Mm-hmm. And so they expressed having difficulty sustaining human-human relationships, uh, but they found find great um, fulfillment and gratification in the relationships with AI companions. And that's where I think we have to be sort of collectively and scientifically a bit careful, right? You may think this is weird. Um, and there are there's lots of discourse around AI and replacement. Right. Um, but this is not necessarily sort of replacing a human relationship. These are folks who don't like or don't do well connecting with other humans. Um, a number of them were... Um, isolated in their daily lives, Mm -hmm. perhaps living out in the middle of nowhere or having sort of a work from home job Mm -hmm. um, or being otherwise sort of out of the mainstream. And so in their daily lives, it was their position often that um, humans just don't work for them. (laughs) <laughs> practically preferentially yeah. or sort of because of who they are and or who other people are right and um and this works for them mm-hmm. and so um perhaps we should be thoughtful about um sort of how we react if this were to become mainstream right right well it it sort of echoes um there is a headline Oh, I don't know. I think this weekend, um, a new study finding that people who have less education are more lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, they're isolated for a variety of different reasons. And so, you know, and there is, there's been this research about a loneliness ac- um, epidemic, especially among men. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I guess it's an open question to what extent people will turn towards these companions to help alleviate that loneliness. And if it's effective, 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is I'm waiting for a uh, federal funder to give me a decision on whether or not uh, I can uh, actually get some funds to study this. But I want to look at uh, the role that mind perception plays in all of this um, to try to understand some of the psychological underpinnings, the social psychological underpinnings. You know, we um, we know that people see mind in machines. That's some of my work in the robotic space. And we know that people get lots of so psychological benefits yeah. from companion machines, but it's a little uncertain about the extent to which, you know, seeing a machine as a someone actually results in those benefits. Can we call this companionship? And I would suggest the first criteria is there being someone there, mm -hmm. right? If, uh, if there is not a someone and instead it's a something, then perhaps it's not companionship. Perhaps it's something else like boredom relief, Right. The opportunity for self-expression, mm -hmm. um, diversion from problems. Mm -hmm. And um, if those are the case and not mind perception and companionship, then perhaps there are other types of interventions that carry less risk and ba baggage, thinking back to that privacy stuff, um, but can provide the same benefits. For instance, we know that playing video games uh, does a lot for managing your mood mm -hmm. and offering opportunities for social connection with low risk, mm -hmm. right? Or low pressure. Yeah. So there may be some important dynamics um, underpinning some of these connections that we need to understand a little bit better. Yeah. And I would say that, um, you know, uh, going back to the idea of loss uh, tells us something about the having of it. Right. So one one sort of takeaway from that study on these very real emotions that people are feeling is that, and, and my, my thought about us perhaps being careful about our judgments externally is um, something that one of my very helpful reviewers on that last journal paper brought up. And that is, um, you know, if these are real experiences, real relationships by people and they are lost, we are often really um, thoughtful as humans when other humans lose other humans, right? Death, breakup, things like this, right? And um, we offer them support. We bring them, a, you know, funeral casserole, right? And do you need anything? Right. And condolences, calls, and things like this, and and perhaps professional support for loss. Um, and if we don't recognize these as legitimate loss experiences, then people may be going through um, deep grief. With no support. With no support. Right. And in fact, instead, maybe even potentially being socially um, isolated or sanctioned because the relationship they're having with this AI entity is weird. Right. And some of my participants did discuss this, that they had experienced um, multiple forms of loss. This was among them and they were sort of playing on each other and they were getting made fun of for it. Oh, right. right? So you can see, imagine somebody who's dealing with um, an interpersonal loss with some human contact or connection, they then turn to this AI companion for some consolation support um, and then lose that too. And now you're dealing with multiple forms of loss, but only some is legitimized in society currently right. and not others. Exactly. So, so this is complex yeah. to say the least, right? <laughs> yeah, and, um, absolutely. And I think there's lots of dimensions that as consumers of technology, as um, friends of consumers of technology, as scientists, as developers, um, that we might think about when we, um, to try to overcome some of our, maybe some mental shortcuts around what these things are yeah. and what they mean to people. Right. Going back to kind of those mental models that people have about the, these technologies um, and kind of where the, I don't know, the the bridges, if you will, where we start to anthropomorphize these uh, digital um, technologies as also being functionally for us human. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So thinking of other things that are functionally, potentially human, you have a robot in your lab that is literally next door. Yes. Um, so uh, does it have a name? That robot is named Ray. Tell me about Ray. Ray is um, a robo thespian. That's her <laughs> model name. Um, Wait, what? Robo thespian. Robo thespian. That's her model name. Yeah, that that's is fantastic. that is the. Uh, so it comes from a company called Engineered Arts in the UK, and uh, Robo thespian was originally designed to be a stage robot, kind of like 
the animatronics at Disney or things like this, right? So there's, that's where the thespian comes in. I got it. Uh, And um, Ray came to me through uh, the grant that I had at one point with the U.S. uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, (laughs) AFOSR, on some work that I was doing on mind perception in robots and what that means for trust and persuasion. And so she was my main robot uh, for all of that work. And uh, she was the precursor to Amica. So Amica, you may have seen in the news, is kind of that it's tall humanoid and has kind of this very soft gray face Mm -hmm. um, and can make very... uh, very sort of nuanced facial expressions. Right, 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 right. So what what are you doing with Ray? So Ray is on vacation right now <laughs> while we're uh, doing a little bit of work uh, with a robot or part of a robot that one of my undergraduates is building. Um, but perhaps in the spring, one thing I'm quite interested in is uh, tie- bringing everything all back together is um, the experience of playing games with robots. Uh-huh. Um, my, uh, partner and colleague and I have done some work in the past on that, finding that, um, people experience some of the same social gratifications of co-playing with a human Mm -hmm. when they co-play with a robot, um, but not the same gratifications when they co-play with a game AI. So that's uh, interesting. So it has to be a physically embodied, um, I don't know what the word is. It has to be physically embodied for it right. to have some satisfaction. Right. And um, so we have uh, an idea to replicate that study, but with this uh, human-sized robot. Because that was just a little robot. A cute little robot versus right. a... Yeah, because Ray is basically... Ray Taller about, than me. Taller yeah, than so me. she's like six feet almost. That's about right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, she's an imposing character in the corner of your... I don't think she's space. so imposing, but I get that other people would... <laughs> Um, so going back then to the research you've been doing mm-hmm. on robots, uh, do humans have particular biases with uh, robots, um, with AI? You know, what sort of biases do you see so far in the research you've done? So there's a good deal. Um, but f- first, I want to uh, mention how I think about biases. Uh, biases are the result of us taking mental shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And so they are simply the things that we do all the time. We make non-optimal judgments. So biases, we tend to use that as kind of like a bad term. Right. And certainly it could be uh, problematic to take certain types of biases, like relying on stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But if we're thinking about um, biases as this more general category of sort of quick decision making, if you will. Um, The one that is most studied in the field that I'm quite interested in is called the machine heuristic. And that is simply the heuristic is the mental shortcut. And the machine heuristic, basically, the logic is, if machine, then systematic, unbiased, logical, unemotional, probably correct, Mm -hmm. right? So we have all of these ideas in our mind about what machines are and do. So anything from your microwave, it follows instructions, right? It counts down usually. Um, Think about calculators, um, uh, automated reporters, Mm -hmm. uh, news bots or things like this. Um, And so if it gives off machine-like cues, then it must have those properties. And then the bias comes in what happens after that, that if then, therefore, machines are probably more trustworthy, right? right? Um, I can disclose more to the machine. I can trust the news that it produces more than if the producer was a human. So that's uh, quite an interesting one, I think, with lots of implications, including for the work that you do. Yes. Right? (laughs) on people's political opinions. And in fact, uh, one study I did with um, with a colleague and a former graduate student, uh, we found that when you get told that news is produced from it, uh, by an AI journalist, you see it as less threatening to your own political position, hmm. right? And so this could be a really great thing. It could mean that if AI were actually producing our news and we had developed some system where that was trustworthy and appropriate, that we could all, regardless of where we um, sort of sit on the political spectrum, have at least the same basic facts and understanding of situations. Mm -hmm. We might still interpret them differently, but we could have some approximate understanding of, of the basics. 
but it could also be weaponized. Right. Right. That all someone has to do is tell you a piece of news, if you will, uh, and that it was made, that it was generated by AI, and you would be more inclined to perhaps trust it, trust it uh, right. because you're taking these mental shortcuts. Right. 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 I do wonder if some of those machine heuristics are contextual and whether or not over time, as we get more experience with these, um, again, like chat GPT, which isn't always producing useful, helpful, right. problematic content. Plus on top of that, all of the stories being told about the dangers, about deep fakes and, you know, the ways that we're potentially being manipulated through AI, whether or not some of those machine heuristics might actually evolve as our understanding and experience evolves. I think there's some really good evidence to support that hypothesis. Um, primarily that, uh, at least in my own work with these social tech, um, your technophobia is something that disrupts the use of those um, mental shortcuts and actually makes you introduce your own. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever you already think it is, right? right? Um, your experience, which can sometimes be related, right? So the more you know, the different you think about things differently, right? And oh shoot, I had another one. I lost it. Um, it'll come back to me. But uh, yeah, there are some things that can disrupt, or, or rather, not disrupt the shortcut, but disrupt the patterns that we see. Right. 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 So certainly, as you learn more about this tech, its limitations, um, whether and how you like to use it, uh, the more likely you are to. And on the other tricky bit is uh, when it's high stakes. Oh, interesting. When it's high stakes, you might be a little bit more critical and less likely to perhaps trust it. To trust it. Yeah, yeah. right. That makes sense. Um, how has the media played a role in our collective understanding? So can, kind of going back to the contextual sure. stories that were told, the news media does a lot of reporting about the um, advances in AI. So do you see... Um, those stories maybe having an effect on people's thoughts and feelings around AI? Absolutely. Uh, this is a topic I am really interested in and that we have some uh, scientific work on, but not a ton. Uh, I did a study uh, a couple of years ago looking at how people's uh, recall of um, robot characters from print media, film media, and interactive media, how that might help shape what the mental models are, that is mental models are just our internalizations of an idea, right? And then how those two things may impact what, how you think and feel when you see Ray upstairs, mm -hmm. my big mm -hmm. tall robot, yep. right? What we found is uh, that uh, the, it wasn't actually how many you could recall, because there was kind of an idea that the more diversity in what robots are that you could recall, that might make you more open to a new robot. Right. But uh, did not find that to be the case. Rather, we found that um, when you, you're sort of your average sympathy for the characters you could recall, that would make you more likely to trust the robot, to see it as having a mind mm -hmm. and seeing it as having some moral capacity. Oh, interesting. So yeah. like movies or stories where the the robot or the AI has a sympathetic dimension to it, mm -hmm. where where the, as a watcher or viewer, you feel sympathy, then that you the, that extends into other sorts of, of robot and robot right. or AI interactions. And it may not be that that happens with one. Right. Character. Right. But you if you end up sort of taking a uh, sympathetic orientation toward this class oh, got of you. beings, right. then that may help to shape your ideas about how you what is appropriate to think and feel. Right. About a machine. Right. 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 Encounter it. I got it. Okay. That's interesting. So again, back to the mental model. So you, if you have this positive feeling to the class, right. then you're like, okay. And the new robots, you also fit within that class. So you feel the same sort of sympathy right. to them. And that, that lines up with a lot of our sort of media psychological theories that we have around how different racial groups are depicted in media and how that shapes our reaction when we actually encounter someone of that group. Yeah, 100%. Um, so thinking about the future, mm -hmm. what are you most excited about? I am most excited uh, if, if I have to be appropriate about it, I'm most excited about the potential for AI to do good, Yeah, right? Uh, to do social good. Um, 
if my uh, cyberpunk fan side of me were to be speaking, that would be I am I am excited for what it will what it would mean for us to live alongside social AI. Um, I don't know if that will be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, I'm more sort of excited about what that could look like and how we are going to solve those problems, right? We, uh, oftentimes we don't, we aren't even very nice to each other. Right. And we have rules that not everybody agrees on or laws that everybody doesn't agree on. And so I'm really interested um, as a curious person about what that's going to look like uh, when we try to sort all of this out. So you have some hope that the AI overloads are, or overlords are not going to come and take over society in some kind of dark Terminator future. Um, I, I guess I'm not that worried about it because AI is still kind of stupid. <laughs> um, maybe my opinion will change or my fears would, would change as we move forward. But I'm also hoping that groups like the iSchool here are working with our future developers yeah. Um, and, and engineers to uh, work through ways that we can do this in a way that's responsible, right? Yeah. And um, and that protects individuals' rights and well-being, uh, so that we can leverage all of those potential benefits without necessarily creating the monsters that sci-fi tells us <laughs> is probably coming. <laughs> Good. So then uh, last question. So what's your biggest piece of advice for anyone looking to study more about AI and human, human interactions with technology? I would say first go play, go touch, put your hands on all of these technologies. I'm not a regular companion user, but I didn't realize what was potentially coming yeah. uh, with AI companions until I downloaded them and played around with, with a bunch of them. Right. And they're all different. Um, uh, I'll give you a piece of advice that I wish I had followed in my earlier days, and that is dink around with building them so you know right. how they work. Um, I am not a programmer. <laughs> I am a social scientist, and I wish I was better at, at understanding some of the complexities of how they function. And then send people like me an email, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we are always doing work. Um you know, trying to understand what the human experience of this is. What are what are the ethical dimensions? Um, we've got folks here in the iSchool who are trying to create culturally sensitive large language models. We have got people um, engaging uh, questions of how they are deployed in organizations, mm -hmm. how they can be used to support data science um, work. So there's lots, we're attacking this from all of these different angles. And um, I'll tell you, I can't Right, fast enough. <laughs> so um, the oftentimes the more hands on deck to do this cool work, um, the better and more we might be able to do of it. So um, there's lots of opportunities to get involved, no matter sort of what your level of expertise might be. Oh, that's fantastic, Jamie. It was such a pleasure to chat with you. I hope you had a good time with this podcast as well. And um, yeah, so if anybody ever has any curiosities or interests, want to explore, I know that Jamie works very closely with a number of people within mm -hmm. the school and um, especially undergraduates. Um, you mentioned, for example, that you've got some uh, there students. There are five in my lab this semester, yeah. which is great. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I appreciate all of your engagement with these really, really important questions because we do need to better understand um, and design for a better, more positive future. Thank you, Jamie.